Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and in this video we're going to look at the degradation of materials. Now there's three different types of degradation that we're interested in. Chemical degradation, which is also known as corrosion. Thermal degradation and also degradation by UV or ultraviolet light. Now we're going to apply each of these to our three different classifications of engineering materials, metals, polymers and ceramics. So in the case of metals, we're going to look at chemical degradation or corrosion. In the case of polymers, we're going to look at thermal and UV degradation. And in the case of ceramics, we're going to look at an example of thermal degradation. So as our starting point, we're going to look at the oxidation of copper. And I have an image on the screen here that I borrowed from Crescent City Copper. And what this shows is how copper weathers over time. So in the top left hand corner, we see copper when it hasn't been exposed to any weathering. And as we move from left to right, we see how the colour changes within the first year. On the second row, we see the changes from two years to five years. And on the bottom row, we see the changes from seven years to 25 or more years. So we actually see the copper go through browns to blacks and all the way through to greens. Now, a great example of where you may have seen this is on the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is made of copper and because it's been weathering for so many years it now appears to have a green colour. So on first observation it may not be immediately apparent that it's copper but as a result of this weathering process or this oxidation process the colour of the copper has turned to green. Now the name of copper in this state is called patina and it's actually copper carbonate as we'll see in a moment. So what we're interested in is what's happening to the copper during this process. And the starting point is oxidation. And oxidation is basically where copper is corroded or chemically degraded by oxygen. So we know from earlier tutorials that copper is a metal and metals like to donate or lose electrons. Oxygen, on the other hand, is a non-metal and non-metals like to gain electrons. So what we actually see in this case is a transfer of two electrons from copper to oxygen. Well when the copper loses two electrons it becomes two plus and when the oxygen gains two electrons it becomes two minus and they become attracted to each other. What we have here is the formation of an ionic bond. Now copper oxide is typically a dark brown or even a black colour but we can see here that that weathering process continues and what actually happens is the copper oxide that's being formed combines with carbon dioxide. And when it combines with carbon dioxide, what we actually get is copper carbonate. Now copper carbonate has the chemical formula CuCO3. And it's copper carbonate that has this green color. As I mentioned, it's called patina. And this process, as we see here, takes place over a very long period of time. What we're really interested in is what impact this has on the copper. Does it affect its mechanical properties as an example? Now the important thing to note here is this oxidation effect only takes place on the surface. So if we had our piece of material, our piece of copper, then what we would end up with is a thin film of copper oxide originally and then later becoming copper carbonate. But the material on the inside here is unaffected. So in terms of some of its mechanical properties, such as its strength, these would be largely unaffected. Some of the things that would change, however, is the surface would become harder. So the surface of the material is going to have an increased hardness. The carbonate layer is going to have a greater hardness than the soft copper core. Now the other thing that this is going to do is reduce the material's ability to conduct electricity. So we see a decrease in electrical conductivity. But the vast majority of the properties are unchanged. Now there is one big advantage of this process. What this actually does is protect the copper. Once we have this carbonate layer, no further corrosion will take place. The soft copper core will be contained in the center and we have a corrosion resistant skin on the outside of the copper. Let's take a look at corrosion in iron and corrosion in iron is also going to affect steel products as they're largely made of iron. 
So before we discuss the oxidation of iron and steel, which is also known as rusting, let's just watch a short video of this process. So what we have here is a time-lapse video for the rusting of this steel or iron plate. And what we notice happen is that the plate begins to oxidise, and this happens in isolated locations. In effect, what the oxygen and the water are doing is they're attacking the plate at its weakest points. There may be surface defects or scratches, or even small cracks in the surface of the material. And that's where the rusting will begin. So the video we've just seen there was created by Cardiff University and it showed the development of rust on that steel plate. Now what we're interested in, first of all, is what's actually happening in the case of rusting and secondly, how it affects the material. This is an oxidation process, but this is a little bit more complicated because this will only occur in the presence of oxygen and water. Now once again, this happens in stages because the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to end up with a hydroxide of iron. And this hydroxide forms again because of the donating of electrons from the iron. So iron has lost three electrons, it's become three plus, and each of the hydroxide groups has in effect gained an electron. So again we have an ionic bond forming. But this isn't the end of the story because rust is actually iron oxide and not iron hydroxide. So what happens is these iron hydroxides dehydrate and when they dehydrate we're going to get the formation of iron oxide Fe2O3. This process is a little bit more complicated than the oxidation of copper but nonetheless we arrive at iron oxide and iron oxide is rust. We know that each iron atom there has donated three electrons so in total the two iron atoms has donated six electrons, and those six electrons have gone to the three oxygen atoms. Now the huge difference here is the way that rust propagates through a steel or iron component, and what we see happening is the rust or the iron oxide begins to flake. Now when that flakes, it creates cracks within the material, and into those cracks, the oxygen and water can then penetrate. So what we see in the case of steel components is the rust will actually develop throughout the material, and we saw that in the video there. Now this does have a huge detrimental impact on things such as steel structures, because a number of things are going to happen. First of all, the material is going to become more brittle. It's often the case that the cross section will reduce as well as the flakes of rust break off, and this is going to have a huge impact on the strength of the material. So in the case of rusting, we see the strength go down, we see brittleness go up, and we see the hardness of the surface increase. The material that hasn't been affected by the rust closer to the centre of a component is still going to maintain its properties, but the damaging effect of rust is that it can actually penetrate through the material with time. Unlike with copper oxide, there isn't really any positives to be said about iron oxide, and engineers take every length they can to prevent the rusting process from happening. So next, let's take a look at our polymers. And in polymers, there's two different types of degradation that we're interested in, UV degradation and thermal degradation. And in actual fact, they both cause very similar types of damage. So there are many polymers that are susceptible to UV and thermal damage, and we have pictured here polyethylene. So ultraviolet light and thermal energy both have a similar effect on our polyethylene chains and they cause something called scission. And what scission is, is the breaking of bonds. So scission, which is the breaking of bonds. Now if the UV intensity or the thermal intensity is high enough, then basically what happens is we get bonds being broken. It might be the bond between a carbon and a hydrogen, as shown there, or it might be the bond between a carbon and a carbon. But when these bonds break, what it creates is something called a free radical, and free radicals are highly reactive. The reason for this is, if we break the bond between the carbon and hydrogen, both the hydrogen and the carbon are going to retain their electrons. So we're going to have an electron here on the carbon, and we're going to have an electron here on the hydrogen. 
Now neither the carbon nor the hydrogen have a complete outer shell, so they're going to be keen to go on and react with other materials. So let's remove our hydrogen for a moment. So by removing our hydrogen, we've created an unstable carbon atom. And the polymer chain we see there is what's known as a free radical. But let's take a look at our other polyethylene molecule, and let's assume this time that this bond here gets broken. Now once again, when this bond breaks, one carbon is going to take its electron with it, and so is the other carbon. So we're actually going to create two more free radicals. The problem here during this process is that we're creating all of these highly reactive particles, not only in terms of these polymer free radicals, but also in the example of our detached hydrogen. And there isn't any way of determining what each of these particles are going to react with. They all want to react with each other. Now, if you think back to an earlier tutorial where we talked about how a material's properties are affected by how easily layers of particles slide over each other, what we see in the case of polyethylene is that the two polymer chains are generally free to move in relation to each other. So we have strong bonds within the chains themselves, but the chains are only held together by weak forces and can therefore move in relation to each other. But what can happen as a result of UV and thermal degradation is that we actually end up with branched polymers. So here we might end up with a hydrocarbon group, like so. Now we can instantly see that the effect of that will be that these layers will no longer slide as easily past each other. We're actually going to look at this in a little more detail if you study the materials unit with us. But in effect, what we've created is an irregular or amorphous polymer structure. So in terms of UV and thermal degradation, what we see is an increase in brittleness. It's called embrittlement of the polymer. And what this means is that the polymers are no longer flexible and elastic, they're much more likely to break as a result of bending and flexion. So the last point to make clear about UV and thermal degradation is that the intensity of the ultraviolet light, or the thermal intensity, will dictate how quickly or slowly this process develops. So if the exposure to UV or thermal energy is high, then this process will develop much more rapidly than if the exposure is low. So there we see polymer degradation, both UV degradation and thermal degradation. In our last example, we're going to look at thermal degradation of ceramics. Now, in relation to ceramics, what we're going to discuss is something called thermal shock. And you're probably already familiar with thermal shock. A prime example of where this would occur is if you were to take a hot dish out of the oven and then place it in cold water, is that that dish would actually crack as a result of thermal shock. Now, what happens when we heat things is they expand. And when we cool things, they contract. And providing the piece of material is able to conduct those heat changes throughout the piece of material, then there's no reason why thermal shock would occur. But as we know in the case of ceramics, they have low thermal conductivity. And what this means is that it takes a long time for a ceramic material to heat up and it takes a long time for a ceramic material to cool down. Not only that, we end up with thermal gradients within the material. So the material could be hot, we could try to cool the material, but in effect, only the surface will be cooled. It will take much longer for that heat to propagate through the material. So what we end up with is we end up with expansion and contraction at different rates. And if the surface is contracting, whilst the core is expanding, what we actually begin to get is stress cracks. On the left hand side here we see an example of how stress cracks can propagate. Now the example I gave of the dish coming from the oven and being placed in cold water would only represent one cycle of thermal shock. But if the heat changes were much smaller or much more gradual then we can still induce this thermal shock but in a much more cyclic nature. So something might be heated and cooled a number of times and in doing so we begin to develop these surface cracks or these micro cracks. Now, as you can imagine, these surface cracks make the material more vulnerable or more prone to cracking. 
So in actual fact, what this is going to do is it's going to decrease the strength of the material. If a material has a lot of surface cracks, then it's much more likely to fail or rupture. In addition to reducing the strength, it's going to reduce the toughness. These surface cracks are going to make it much more susceptible to failure due to impact loading. So thermal shock as a degradation process is when something is heated and cooled over a number of cycles. The failure of the material may come much later after a number of cycles of heating and cooling and as a result of decreases in strength and toughness. So in this video we've looked at the degradation of metals, polymers and ceramics. For metals we've looked at chemical degradation or corrosion. For polymers we've looked at thermal and UV degradation and finally for ceramics we've looked at thermal degradation in relation to cycles of thermal shock.